welcome back. It's a pleasure to have uh, Amy Volkinson uh, from the University of Chicago. She's going to tell us about asymmetrical dysmorphisms. Thank you. Thank you, Mark. I, uh, I'm very happy to be here. Thank you for having me. I want to thank, obviously, the organizers and the Graduate Center for inviting me. I also want to thank Keo and Dick Canary for kindly agreeing to move their talk so I could speak now. Unfortunately, I have a family emergency and I have to leave after my talk. I was really looking forward to the other talks, but um, maybe they'll be recorded. I hope so. Um, I also apologize for the lack of abstract. Um, I did write an abstract, but then Ara was a little nervous about posting it on the website. It was supposed to be approved by Dennis. I, don't I know. approved it. You did? Oh, okay. Well, here's the abstract. <laughs> it's, it wasn't an insult. I will discuss the result with Bonatti and Provisier from 2009 showing that the C1 generic diffeomorphism F of a closed manifold has trivial centralizer. I'll explain to you what that means. Um, I'll discuss features of the C1 topology that enable our proof. Uh, the analogous statement is open in general in the CR topology for R greater than one. I'll also discuss some features of the proof and depending on how much Dennis interrupts me, <laughs> some recent directions of my work between the non <laughs> Well, I'm glad you approved it. I think you would be insulted by that. Um, and, you know, I, have a, I actually have a, a lot to thank Dennis for. Um, back when I was a graduate student in 1992, I proved my first, I guess it was my second, but um, I, I proved something with Charles Tresser. And um, Charles asked Dennis if um, I could, or maybe Lisa Goldberg asked Dennis if I could speak in his seminar, and he very generously um, agreed to invite me. And um, it still exists. The talk was recorded. It still exists on the internet. It's kind of embarrassing, but um, it's very green. Um, but I still remember part of the talk when I thought like my proof, my entire proof had fallen apart and I was just standing there like, wait, something's wrong and I can't figure this out. And Dennis reassured me and said, don't worry, you've gotten this far. It's, it's right, it's gonna be fine. Um, anyway, so that was just the beginning and I have other um, stories about Dennis that I would love to share at the banquet, but I don't have time. So I'm gonna get started. So, uh, as I said in the abstract, um, and the abstract of this talk, um, what I want to talk about is actually work from almost 15 years ago with Christian Bonetti and Sylvain Corbusier, uh, and it concerns um, properties of generic diffeomorphisms. Uh, so, as background, I want to say a little bit about the group of diffeomorphisms of a manifold. Okay, so we fix a closed connected manifold M, and I denote by diff super R of M the set of all CR diffeomorphisms of M. Okay, that is a set, but it has uh, more structure, natural structure. So um, it's a topological group under composition, uh, the identity being the identity element. Uh, topological is with respect to the CR topology. So I could actually put the CS topology for any S less than R, and it would also be a topological group. Um, so that means that uh, composition and inversion are um, continuous in that topology. Um, and the CR topology in particular um, makes this a complete metric space. Um, and that implies it's a bare space. And that's actually going to be an important feature because I'm going to talk about residual subsets of diff um, or generic properties of diffeomorphisms. So just to recall what residual means. So a subset of a bare space is residual if it contains a countable intersection of open and dense sets. And the bare category theorem tells us that the intersection 
uh, such an intersection is itself dense. Residual subsets are large in, in a topological sense. Um, the intersection of two residual subsets, for example, is residual. And the same is not true for just dense. Okay? So we're going to take this as one sense of a very large set. And I say that the property of the diffeomorphism is generic if it holds on a residual set of diffeomorphisms. OK. And I threw in a, a, a kind of a lovely fact about the, the group of diffeomorphisms, um, which kind of fits into the theme of Dennis's seminar about algebraic structures and topological structures being connected. Here, algebraic and smooth structures are connected. Um, and this is a result of Filipkowitz in 1982. He proved that if you have an isomorphism between diff R of M and diff S of M, then M and N are diffeomorphic, R and S are equal, and the automorphism is an inner automorphism, meaning it's induced by a diffeomorphism between the two manifolds. Okay. That's pretty cool. He even can distinguish R and so S. So isomorphic as groups? As groups, just yes. As group. Just Abstract as groups. Group. Abstract <laughs> groups determines both the smooth structure determines the smooth structure and the manifold. Um, I'm not going to use that fact, but I just think it's a very cool one. And there's been subsequent work on that problem um, that I'd love to talk about some other time. OK, so in classical dynamics, um, and I'm using this term kind of loosely, um, one takes a diffeomorphism, one fixes a diffeomorphism, and then iterates, iterates it, which means compose it with itself <coughs> n times, or maybe compose its inverse with itself n times. and um, looks for kind of long-term, quote unquote, behavior. My husband tells me I should not use behavior because no one knows what that means. But um, behavior, what does it do? How does it act on the manifold? What? We don't hear our husbands. What about husbands? We don't hear our husbands. We don't hear our husbands. That's correct. I'm not allowed to mention my husband. <laughs> okay. Okay, so things we look for in dynamics, I mean, various forms of recurrence, sets of points that are recurrent, uh, recurrent meaning coming back to themselves. Um, periodic points, um, are there dense orbits? Is there positive entropy? Is it is the dynamical system chaotic? And so on. I'm not really going to talk at all about these properties, um, but but those are kind of the, the classical questions uh, in smooth dynamics. Um, and, oops, good. And then modern, and I'm definitely putting this in quotes because in some sense, you know, you can look in the work of Poincaré and you see the same types of questions. Um, consider subgroups of this group of diffeomorphisms, so not just the group generated by the subgroup generated by a single element. OK, thanks. Um, but um, you could take, you know, if you have a Z2 subgroup, for example, to commuting elements. And then you can ask classical questions about the dynamics of that subgroup, where you replace orbit of a point um, just by applying iterates of a single diffeomorphism. Orbits now become the image of a point under a whole group of diffeomorphisms. Um, and there's many questions you can ask, like which, given a manifold, given an R, which types of subgroups can occur? Can you classify the subgroups that can, that can occur? Um, the Zimmer program, which is recently um, solved, or at least part of it, um, by Sebastian here in the front row, and um, Brown and um, Dave Fisher says that lattices in uh, high enough rank Lie groups, the semi-simple Lie groups, cannot act on low-dimensional manifolds. So certain groups can definitely not act faithfully, cannot be subgroups of diff RM. So there's a lot of interesting questions in this more expanded view of dynamical systems 
um, where time is, is replaced by um, the action of the group. Okay. So in classical, so what I'm going to talk about is sort of straddles this kind of classical and modern point of view within classical dynamics. Um, you can ask which properties, and these are not properties, these are sort of questions, but you can ask which dynamical properties are generic in the group of all diffeomorphisms. So meaning, um, if I look, I fix some property, like having positive entropy, and I uh, look at the diffeomorphisms with positive entropy, is that group, is that set residual? And then you would say that positive entropy is generic, which it's not. But um, in any case, we can still ask which, which properties are generic. That's a pretty tall order because you're asking like that the typical diffeomorphism have some property. Like what, so if you think about it, like some property would have to be kind of very random, right? Um, but even some properties that seem naturally like very random, like if you know what ergodicity is, ergodicity with respect to volume in the C, given the manifold, in the C high enough R topology, that is not a generic property. So um, in any case, there is one well-known generic property, sorry, uh, and that's um, a property about periodic points. And so it says that for any manifold and for any R, generically, in the space of CR diffeomorphisms, um, the periodic points are isolated of a given period. Um, so there's finitely many. They're all hyperbolic. And it actually says something about their stable and unstable manifolds they have to intersect transversally. So I'm going to come back to stable and unstable manifolds, hopefully, later in the talk. <laughs> Um, but um, if I have a periodic point um, and it's hyperbolic, meaning the derivative of the map at that periodic point, the derivative of the return, um, has no eigenvalues of absolute value 1, then it always has, through that point, something called an unstable manifold and a stable manifold, or maybe it has only a stable manifold because it's a sink, or an only an unstable manifold, which would be a basin if it's a source. But um, there's always smooth manifolds that are tangent to the expanding and contracting eigenspaces, and such that if I take a point on a stable manifold, its forward orbit will accumulate on the orbit of this point in forward time, and on the unstable manifold in backwards time. Okay. So this is a basic fact. And generic diffeomorphisms, all of the periodic points look like this. Or maybe they're a source or a sink. And even more so, if I have two periodic orbits and I look at the stable of one and the unstable of the other, they will intersect generically, transversely, which they could not intersect at all. And there are infinitely many intersection points sometimes, right? Right. Oh, definitely. For example, once you have, for a periodic point like this, a saddle, if I have one intersection point, then I actually, by iteration, I have to have infinitely many along that stable manifold, infinitely many here, and that's a mechanism for chaos. Okay? So um, Kukis mail does not say generically you have chaos because you might not have any intersections at all between stable and unstable, or you might not have any periodic points at all. But OK, this is a, what I was trying to say earlier is this is actually, in some ways, a, a rather <clears throat> remarkable theorem, or maybe something atypical in that uh, it's actually been proved for all R. So the typical C1 diffeomorphism, the typical C2. Um, something being C1 generic and something being C2 generic, they're just like utterly incompatible. They don't, like the property being C1 generic does not imply C2 pretty obviously, but C2 generic does not imply C1. Okay, because you're taking, you're using both openness 
and intersections and the two, you know, one topology is finer than the other, but you're kind of mixing, um, you're mixing um, both closed and open. Those two notions get mixed in the definition. Okay. Are you assuming R is an integer? Yeah, R is an integer. Yeah, let's say R is an integer for the purposes of the talk. Okay. Um, so there are other genericity results, um, but they've um, some of them are local gen genericity results, or you might say generically you have this behavior or this behavior, that kind of thing. And there's actually quite a few for the case when R is one, and that's because the C1 topology is much more flexible than the C2 topology. It has some really nice features that I'm going to mention. Now, I remember Dennis telling me that, that the PL topology is something we should all be studying more. Is that, did you say that once? I liked it. You liked it. <laughs> <laughs> um, it's interesting. There are some interesting things. I mean, you know, anyway, I'm not going to get off on that tangent. So. Um, the big example, the kind of, the thing that started it all for the C1 topology is the closing lemma, lemma in quotes, of Pew. Um, so what does Pew's closing lemma say? C1 closing lemma. It says, suppose I have a point that's recurrent, meaning its forward orbit accumulates on itself under a diffeo. The closing lemma says, by a C1 small perturbation of f, so arbitrarily close in the C1 topology, there's a map where that point is actually periodic. So you take an orbit that's almost closed, and you close it. OK, so this sounds like, um, when you first hear this theorem, it sounds almost like, well, that shouldn't be hard. Um, because why don't you just take your point um, it comes back close to itself and just, just locally just move the point uh, a little bit over so that the image, instead of coming close to itself, actually hits itself. Um, the problem is that you can't do that necessarily uh, in a C1 small perturbation. So here's an example. This is an orbit. If you want, you can think of this as an orbit of a flow, or maybe it's, it's just a rendering of um, uh, of an orbit of a diffeomorphism by a curve. And so here I have a, a recurrent orbit. It's recurring along those horizontal lines. Um, and let's focus on the region of recurrence. And look, and let's especially focus on these two parts of the orbit. And you'll notice, if you trace things around, that if I were able to connect this part of the orbit to this part of the orbit, I would close the orbit. Just like that. So if I do that, so if I change the diffeomorphism just in this little box, in fact, just in this little green region, uh, I um, will close that orbit. And notice, I have to do it in the green region because if I don't, I mean, for this method to work, because if I get further away from the green region, I will affect other parts of the closed, of the orbit that was already kind of there. Um, and I could change, you know, it might not be closed once I make that connection. And so this is a C0 small perturbation. Um, I've just, in fact, I could localize this in a tiny region I want, and I can close it. So that's the kind of obvious C0 closing lemma. But this is not C1 small. And the reason is exactly what I said before. Um, these lines that are very, very close, I can't touch them. And I have two parts of the orbit that are very close to each other. Um, and I have to connect one to the other, but then I can't change this at all. And I can't change it. The derivative has to be the identity outside of this small region. And you see that the derivative here is definitely not the identity the one I needed to connect these two. And so I have a very tiny region to go from a definite derivative to derivative the identity. And that is not C1 small. Obviously, 
<laughs> it depends on what you mean by small, but I'm just trying to illustrate the picture. Um, and so, yeah, so here is a C1 small perturbation. It would look like this. You could gradually go from this out to the identity. But then it no longer has a closed orbit, okay? No closed orbit. So what Pew's uh, C1, what the closing lemma does is really a lot more, um, a lot more subtle. He first extracts some suborbit that's carefully chosen, um, and then he perturbs all the way around the orbit. He perturbs F to make it close. So, um, oh, obviously this, so, um, so I've, I've created a closed orbit out of a recurrent orbit, um, but it it's, requires a perturbation all the way down the orbit. And um, a selection, a careful selection of what part of the orbit you want to close. Okay, and so just the, the final point I want to make is that um, it's, this question is open in the C2 topology. And most people, I don't know if most, but a lot of people think it's probably not true. What about C1 plus alpha? So C1 plus alpha um, is, is just as bad as C1, as bad as C2. Yeah. Yeah. So and there are examples to show that, you know, how Pew's perturbation was in a neighborhood of this orbit, right? But there are examples that show that if you want to close any uh, orbit for a C2, you might have to do a global perturbation outside of the neighborhood of the orbit. So it, it, if it's true, it would require very different methods. Okay, so that's yes, just... Yes, they are. On the these nowadays is see infinitely close to them for volume preserving. Right, sorry. Yeah, so yes, there have to be very different global... You have to do a very different global type of perturbation if in the fact, if, if you're in the case where you have a closed surface, and you restrict to volume preserve or area preserving diffeomorphisms, then in fact the closing lemma is true in the C infinity topology. And that follows from arguments uh, in symplectic, using symplectic invariance. So it's a completely different ballgame. But yeah, very recent work shows that. Yes? I actually have this, a question about this Kupka's mail result that you mentioned. Yeah. Earlier. So like, if you fix, for some like fixed K, if you look at how the regularity changes, like CR generic maps, is there a relation between the number of fixed points, of like a, 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 a CR a generic map versus like CS, as R and S change? Um, well, C, so CR uh, generic or is always um, dense in CR minus one. Okay. I got that in the right. Yes, it's always dense in CR minus one, um, but typically not generic. So, I mean, it's a good general question, I'm sure Enrique. With an idea, change. Yeah, I'm sure Enrique has some really good answers. So, but I should move on. Um, so, it's open in general. Okay, so what are the features of the C1 topology uh, that make it special? There's two. There's two key features. The first is um, that um, a diffeomorphism, a C1 diffeomorphism, is approximately linear at small scales. So that's just the definition of differentiability, right? So um, if in this example, x and x naught are very, very close, then the map f looks affine. I say linear, but in fact, it looks like an affine map in charts or linear map in charts. Um, and moreover, that, that linear, linear part changes continuously as I move the point x. So it's also close to being constant if I'm on a small enough scale. Okay, and then the second is, and this is really key, is the scale invariance, um, which means, before you look at what I've written, it just means the following. If I want to achieve a certain effect, for example, I want to move this point to this point by something that's C1 small, I can fix a model at unit scale of a diffeomorphism locally supported that does that. And then I can shrink it down, that diffeomorphism, 
and apply it at any scale I want. And I will not change the C1 size. Okay, so that's all that this says. So this is a, a function, but the same is true for a diffeomorphism. You can look at coordinate functions, for example, um, or you can rescale linear maps. Um, so with a linear map. So consider if I have a function phi um, on the real line, and then I create a function phi sub rho for a very small rho, which just blows things up to unit scale, applies phi, and then scales it back down again, um, then the C1 size of that map is independent. Um, because the derivative is not changed, um, just by the chain rule. Whereas if I take the second derivative of the elf derivative, you see it blows up when I try to scale it down. Okay. So um, huge progress has been made um, in understanding C1 diffeomorphisms of a closed manifold. And I'm just listing, I'm sure, quite the subset, at this point, a huge, just a subset of names. Um, but you will see that in we get right here. <laughs> um, anyway. Um, and this is a picture I like, um, uh, partially conjectural and partially um, proven um, that Christian Moniti drew, um, kind of showing diffeomorphisms kind of categorized in increasing orders of, of uh, complexity, starting with the more smale systems, which look um, almost like gradient-like. You know, you just have finitely many recurrent points and they're all periodic and hyperbolic and every other point is in the stable manifold of one periodic point and the unstable manifold of another and then this is generalized by hyperbolic and so on. Um, tame things far from tangency and so on. And then you have diffeomorphisms with universal dynamics meaning fix any diffeomorphism in the ball you want and somewhere you can find that diffeomorphism inside of a given, your given diffeomorphism or inside a neighborhood of given diffeomorphism. Okay, so that's and is that, that whole diagram generic? So that, that whole diagram is supposed to be interpreted properly, sort of generic in the C1 topology. Some of these are definitely like open, right? But then others would be locally generic. Locally, meaning there's some neighborhood in which the property is generic. Okay, so um, okay, so back to this quote, modern dynamics. Um, so what I was saying before is I want to kind of say something that kind of lies at the juncture of kind of modern dynamics and classical dynamics. Um, so in the context of actions of groups, what kind of generic properties? Do you, would you expect a group of diffeomorphisms to have? Does anyone want to guess? What would be a good guess? Like I take a, when I say generic group, let's say um, finitely generated, K generators. So for the generic pair of diffeomorphisms, what do you think might be the group that it generates? Free group, and in fact that's true. So. Um, and, that's, and it's not hard to prove. In fact, I had a one-page slide with proof, but I know I don't have time, so I'm not going to give it. But um, there's an argument um, in Etienne's Jace's book, Groups Acting on the Circle, that show that if I take, if I look in the space diff cross diff cross diff cross diff k times, in that space, if I take a generic tuple, the group they generate is actually free. There are no relations, and you can think about that. Okay, so here's a kind of, as I said, there's kind of a mixed, this is a little bit more of a mixed question. Um, let's fix a generic F and then ask, does anything, what commutes with F? What's the centralizer of F in the group of diffeomorphisms? Okay, so I'm given an F and I'm looking for the G is the set of all G's 
such that G composed with F equals F composed with G. Okay? That's a subgroup of the group of diffeomorphisms. How big is it? Well, first of all, what's the significance? Well, these diffeomorphisms you can think of as symmetries of F. It's a smooth change of coordinates that takes you back to F. It, it's something that preserves the orbits of F, for example. And so, Smale asked, uh, probably a long time ago, um, whether the generic diffeomorphism should have trivial centralizer. Just meaning that the only things, obviously the iterates of F commute with F, right? So F is a self, uh, kind of an inner symmetry, if you like. Um, but Smell asked, is it true generically, I mean, he was very vague about this, um, is, um, is the centralizer going to be trivial generically? You think that sounds so similar to um, the question of the generic, does the generic generate a free group? But in fact, it's completely false, for example, that for the generic F, every G other than the iterates of F will generate a free group with F. I mean, you can find very small groups. I mean, that's totally false. So, but anyway, so this is a question about symmetries. And his student, Nancy Capello, so we obviously have been thinking of this question for quite a while. So back in 1970, his student, Nancy Capello, proved that for the circle, uh, in diff R, for any R at least two, in fact, the generic F does have no symmetries, no non-trivial, trivial centralizer. Okay, so this is the question that I referred to in my abstract, um, and <coughs> and this is the result that I referred to um, in my abstract. Oh, I should say, um, since then, 1970, there have been partial results uh, addressing this question. So Palos Nyokos famously proved this, um, kind of the analog of Capel's result for axiom A, like diffeomorphism, so hyperbolic diffeomorphisms generically. Um, in fact, open densely in the CR topology for R at least too. Um, in that class, so sort of locally, generically, you have trivial centralizers. And I just threw in the names of a couple of my students who worked on this. Lizzie Burslem proved this for certain partially hyperbolic diffeomorphisms, and Todd Fisher did in the C1 topology for axiomatic diffeomorphisms, I think. Um, and this is the result I mentioned. So we proved this in the C1 topology, because again, C2 is super hard. Um, the C1 generic diffeomorphism of any closed manifold has trivial centralizer. Um, so just a remark, um, Capel's result actually shows that trivial centralizer is open and dense in the CR topology for R at least true, the two. Um, but in fact, when R is one, it's actually not open, okay? So this even applies to the circle and gives something different in some sense than Capel's result. It's, it's only generic, it's not open and dense in general. Um, and that's true on any manifold. Okay, so just to restate what um, trivial centralizer means, residual set so that the centralizer is just the group generated by F. Okay. All right? Okay, so um, I wanted to discuss the kind of easy case of our theorem which uh, is a theorem about diffeomorphisms of the interval. Um, and um, I'm going to look, because the generic, um, because of kupke smale the generic diffeomorphism of the interval, let's just talk about orientation preserving, um, is going to have finitely many fixed points that are hyperbolic. So what I want to look at is a, a fixed point that's a sink, and I want to look at the part of um, that diffeomorphism uh, between two sources. Um, and um, I'm going to, if I take a G that commutes with such an F, it will preserve 
it will permute the fixed points, but easily you can see by perturbation, you can make it actually fix those fixed points. Okay, and so really you reduce the question to a diffeomorphism of the interval with a single sink on the inside and fixing the endpoints. Okay, so let's take such an F and let's look at the consequences of commuting with G, where G is some other diffeomorphism. So F is, just to explain those arrows, F is just taking x and it's moving it toward the fixed point and of course it, it will accumulate there. Okay, so if we assume that g commutes with f, then that implies that g commutes with any iterative f. Um, and so if we apply the chain rule and plug in the point x, we get the following consequence. So we can double check that. Um, and so now if I take a ratio, so if I divide in the right way, I get that for any k, the derivative of f to the k at x divided by the derivative of f to the k at g of x is equal to the ratio of these two derivatives. Okay? But g is a diffeomorphism, so its derivative is bounded away from zero and infinity. So this lies in some interval. Okay? So if g commutes with f, then the derivative of any iter of f at x and the derivative of any iter at gx, or in fact any g of the k of x, g of the l of x, is always going to be bounded. Well, now another thing I learned from, I, probably from Dennis, is what bounded distortion means. So the way he described it is that if I have something that's hyperbolic, like f, because right, this has a hyperbolic fixed point and everything's coming in, and the, it's a C2 diffeomorphism, then if I look at, so maybe this isn't something just, anyway, if I, I no, look C1 at. C1 plus alpha is real crucial. Okay, C1 plus alpha, in yeah. fact, is fine, yeah. Um, and I look at the iterate, like the kth iterative of f, it's going to be, it's actually going to look pretty linear. It's, it's not going to, there's not going to be a buildup of distortion. So if I were to color an interval for C2 diffeomorphism, if I were to color it with crayon and apply F to the K, um, it would still look like it was pretty evenly covered, colored with crayon. You wouldn't see these dark and light bits, you know, where, where the derivative is concentrated. The derivative is almost constant um, on small enough scales. Okay. But, Someone asked, well, what about generic properties for C1 versus properties for C2? Generically, C1 diffeomorphisms do not have this property. Okay, well, let me say what I mean by this. So, clearly, if g of x is equal to, let's say g of x equals x, well, clearly this is going to hold for any g, right? Because the ratio is 1. If g of x is some, is like f of x, then this is also going to hold. It's going to be bounded for all k. If g is some iterate of f, if g of x is f to the l of x, then actually there's no contradiction in a statement like this. You can check the chain. But if I take this c1, I should have said c1 generic. F actually has the unbounded distortion property, unlike C2 diffeomorphisms, which have bounded distortion. And so what that says is if I take any pair of points in the interval, if the ratios of the derivatives are, are bounded, of, of the iterates are bounded for any iterate, then in fact x and y lie in the same f orbit. So why is this true? I'm not keeping track of time. So th the reason this is true, well, you have to exhibit a countable intersection of open and dense sets that has this property. So um, I, I'm not going to go through that construction. But essentially, you can kill this property, at least for a given k, you can kill 
the property, this property here, so for a given k and c um, and a given interval, you can kill this property by, by doing something to f to the k of the interval, changing things there. So there's a way that, and all the further iterates, all the iterates up to f to, up to the k, sorry. And so just by like making the derivative kind of bumpy enough, I can, I can make things as distorted as I want. And I can do that for any k by a very small perturbation. And the reason is I can insert C1 small perturbations at arbitrarily small scales. So I, you know, I have f, and as I get smaller and smaller scale, I can make the same type of perturbation, which compounds itself and makes the derivative unbounded. So I can do that as long as um, my, my pair of points aren't actually lying on um, the same f orbit. So that's, that's a key fact and very simple. Okay, so how do we go from this really baby fact, um, which is kind of interesting in itself, to the full result on C1 diffeomorphisms? Well, we have to know uh, what is the structure of a C1 generic diffeomorphism. And this is going to use um, the results of quite a few people that I mentioned before. Um, uh, the, the, one of the very important ingredients is by the collaborators, uh, Sylvain and Christian. Um, so suppose this is my manifold. Um, and, okay, I'm just gonna blow it up a little, yes. Okay. Um, and so I'm just drawing, I'm depicting the periodic points <coughs> for this diffeomorphism. And uh, the larger the period, the smaller the points, right? Um, so in fact, um, um, there's, generically there's going to be at least one periodic point. And this follows from, from Pew's lemma. Um, in fact, they'll be dense in the so-called non-wandering set. Anyway, so here's, here's this picture of periodic points. And um, so the kukis male theorem says that the picture of the periodic orbits looks something like this. So for a given period, there's only finitely many, okay? So you have to go deeper and deeper in the period to see more and more of them. Um, so they're isolated. And not only that, they're hyperbolic. So I didn't say that, but every such point will be a sink or a source or a saddle type. And, um, sorry, Dennis, can you see? Okay. Uh, and they'll all have stable and unstable manifolds. So a sink will have a basin, a disk that's attractive, a source will have a, a basin as well, and then the saddle types will have stable and unstable manifolds. Um, locally, they look like this, but globally, you know, these manifolds can do all, pretty much anything. They just are constrained to, to intersect other, stable manifolds are constrained to intersect other unstable manifolds transversely. Okay, um, so that's Kupke's male. And um, now what I'm depicting here is the wandering set. So what is the wandering set? Well, a point is wandering if it has a neighborhood um, so that if I look at all the iterates of this neighborhood, they're all disjoint from each other. So wanders if it has yeah, a wandering neighborhood. So the, the set of wandering points is open. And so here I'm depicting the wandering set. So this sink, for example, a periodic point is non-wandering, obviously, because it's fixed, right? But everything in the basin of a periodic point wanders. Uh, I'm sorry, of a sink wanders, because I can put a, neighbor, a neighborhood a small enough neighborhood of a point, the iterates are disjoint. It's, it's, it's wandering off to the fixed point. Um, and so there's, but there's also parts of the not wandering set that, you know, move around. They just never come back. And then of course there's the basins for some of these, for the sources of the sinks. Okay, and so the complement of the wandering set is a compact invariant set known as the non wandering set. And what Pew proved is that, this is a consequence of, of Pew's closing lemma, is that generically, 
again, C1 generically, periodic points are dense in this non-wandering set. Okay, so obviously you can't get periodic points in the wandering set. This is impossible because you'd have to come back to yourself. But then in the complement, periodic points are dense. So this is a very powerful consequence of Fuse theorem. Um, and now I want to look at the interior of the non-wandering set. Okay? It's, an, uh, it's a compact set, but it might have interior. right? So I'm breaking it into um, components. So now you see we have some connected components of the interior. Um, and and this is the theorem of, of Solan and Christian I was mentioning. Um, suppose I take a periodic point up there, that green dot, okay? And I look at its stable or, or unstable manifold. Um, and what this says is that the stable or unstable manifold at that point, both of them, are dense in the component of the interior containing them. So if this is obviously true for a sink, right? Because the, the, the basin of the sink will be a component of the non-wandering set of the wandering set. Sorry, we're talking about the non wandering forget about that. <laughs> okay, um, this is true for saddles. Um, not sinks and sources, this statement doesn't make sense. But this is a, a, oh, well no, it does make sense, sorry. If I have a sink, the component of the non-wandering set it, it, containing it is the sink itself. And that's because it's surrounded by a wandering basin. So in fact, it's true for any of these points. Okay, so you have sort of that kind of picture. Okay, now let's think about that kind of picture and let's look at that point that's in the non-wandering set, that periodic point, and look at its, say, um, let's look at its stable manifold. Well, what are the dynamics on the stable manifold? The dynamics are pretty much the same as the dynamics we saw in the baby case, where we had, it's not an interval, but we have a, a map contracting toward a fixed point. And so what we can prove along this manifold is that generically, now of course you have to be able to consider perturbations that extend outside of the stable manifold itself, but that's not hard, that generically we have this unbounded distortion property on stable manifolds. So I hope it sounds kind of reasonable. If we could do it on the interval, we could do it on the disk. If we could do it on the disk, we could do it on, we only have to do it locally, right? We can do it uh, uh, on a stable or unstable manifold, okay? So generically, we have the unbounded distortion property for points, all points, on the stable manifold of uh, a periodic point, okay? And, well, it's dense in this component, and so, uh, well, first of all, that implies that F is a power of G. I'm sorry, G is a power of F on the stable manifold. But then the stable manifold is dense, and so G is a power of F um, on that whole component. Okay, so this is the sort of outline of the proof. So um, the first part is what I just outlined. Um, so we can also do it, by the way, for points that are wandering by a very similar, probably even easier argument. You can make unbounded distortion. Okay. So this gives that for the generic F, if F and G commute, then on each component of the interior of the non-wandering set, which is dense in, um, in the non-wandering set, and for each component of the wandering set, we have that G is a power of F, okay? So together, the, the, non, the wandering set plus the interior of the um, wandering set is an open and dense set in the manifold. So now we have something where on each component, G is a power of F, but, but we don't know what power and that power a priori can change. So this is, a, this is the difficult step and I'm just gonna blow past it. But this is actually 
I would say the more difficult step, is just to show that um, L should be constant. It's enough to show that L, Li, these powers are bounded uniformly. Um, and so we do another perturbation. We have this generic set. We perturb again so that um, the derivative of iterates is a little different from unbounded distortion. We show that the derivative of iterates of f blow up on every single orbit, every single orbit um, in this, um, of this diffeomorphism. So to, to ask that this happen for every orbit could, is a de turns out to be a dense property, but um, it's not a generic property. Okay, I have a couple more minutes. This is good. So it's not generic. So now we've found a dense set of F with trivial centralizer. How do we get generic? So in a lot of, a lot of properties that you encounter in dynamics, like ergodicity, for example, if, if I look inside the appropriate space of diffeomorphisms, it's a G delta. It's a countable intersection of open sets. And so if it's dense, then it's a dense G delta. So if I were to show that ergodicity was dense in a group of diffeomorphisms, then it, it would automatically be residual. But um, that is not the case. The property of having trivial centralizer is not a G delta. So um, we have to do something else. Um, and it involves looking at, um, um, it, it involves looking at the map that sends F to its centralizer, where its centralizer is a subset. We, we think of it uh, inside the space of Lipschitz um, diffeomorphisms, or no, sorry, by Lipschitz maps, um, which has some nice kind of local compactness type properties inside of, um, in the C0 topology. So there, there's, there's a, a bit more argument that you have to do. But you do actually get it generic. And so get generic requires more work. And I'll leave it at that. Um, and I just wanted to mention in my last couple minutes, um, the same question for flows is both, it seems to be both easier and harder. So classically, one can just look at a flow, like look at a, a, a smooth vector field, and ask, um, what are the smooth vector fields that commute? Which is to say, what are the smooth flows? Which is to say, what are the vector fields that bracket um, to zero without vector field? And this is a, this is a classically studied question, um, even studied somewhat more recently, um, and the results are kind of what you would imagine, and it's a much easier problem, as it turns out, for flows than for diffios. But here's a hard question. Given a smooth flow, a generic smooth flow, what is the set of diffeomorphisms that commutes with it? Is that set of diffeomorphisms trivial? So we're not necessarily looking at um, things homotopic to the identity, so orbits can be permuted. Um, but even if we look at things homotopic to the identity, they probably don't embed in flows. Um, so very recently, some young people um, proved that um, if I take a C1 generic vector field, um, then the centralizer is, well, it preserves orbits, completely preserves orbits. So uh, centralizer is contained in the set of reparameterizations of the flow. Um, but not constant time, not just multiples. Um, <laughs> except on surfaces where W. Obata proved that, um, that in fact, um, the generic vector field, um, the generic flow um, in the C1 topology now, uh, again, we have to use C1 topology, um, its centralizer is trivial in the, fact, in the sense that um, it's just some speed up or slow down of the flow. Um, there's a sample of further questions. Um, 
<laughs> just to throw out some questions. Um, you know, look at the set of pairs of diffeomorphisms that commute. What is the topology of that set? I don't know. I mean, it's closed. You can say that. But, um, and uh, yeah, so this, this is another question. So as I said, it's not the set of diffeos with trivial centralizer is not a G delta. Is it even a Borel set? And if you look in like the measurable category and you ask the same measure preserving, um, I think Matt Foreman proved that it's not a Borel set. It's an analytic set, but it's not a Borel set. Okay. What's the interior? Does it have interior? Are there diffeomorphisms that stably have trivial centralizer? They're obviously, it, it's not open. I just said that before. It's never open. Um, and then, I guess, Dennis, you didn't interrupt me enough, so I didn't have a chance to say what I've been doing <laughs> recently. So. You didn't make any mistakes. I didn't make any mistakes. <laughs> I've given this talk before. Um, so, uh, with Daniela Dam Damianova Damianovich and Dishang Shu, we've been looking at the question, what if I have a diffeomorphism with large centralizer? What can you say about it? So, for example, a diffeomorphism whose centralizer is the entire group of diffeomorphisms is the identity. And a diffeomorphism, you can completely classify the diffeomorphisms where the group, the diff, where the centralizer acts transitively on the manifold. Again, complete classification, the manifold is a torus bundle over another manifold and um, the diffeomorphism fixes the fibers and acts minimally on the fibers, some power of the diffeomorphism, complete classification. Um, but then there are all these beautiful classical examples of diffeomorphisms that have non-trivial centralizer, namely the affine diffeomorphisms of compact homogeneous spaces. Because these, um, like for example, if I consider um, the left translation uh, by a group element here, then everything that centralizes that element inside of the group, for example, if I had the center of the group, an element of the center, everything that centralizes it also centralizes that action, the, the, the element by the left multiplication. So here's like a general question that I don't know the answer to, but fix an automorphism of a homogeneous space. Assume it's ergodic, you have to do that or this would be false. And now perturb it so that I have a diffeomorphism. If the centralizer is isomorphic algebraically, that they have the same centralizer, are these, is this diffeomorphism diffeomorphic or smoothly conjugate to something, to an affine in the algebraic centralizer? And so we prove this um, for certain examples, um, and we're still working on a lot of other examples. So right now, I mean, there's sort of no way you could prove it for all examples, I think, but um, we've developed a lot of methods. Um, but so what we do is we, in the space of diffeomorphisms, we, we identify the highly symmetric systems. Another example are flows, are highly symmetric systems. Um, in fact, we look at a special kind of flow and also flows geodesic flows and negative curvature. And then our, our aim is to prove that when you perturb, you have a precipitous drop in symmetry. So the, the centralizer drops. But if it stays the same, you have a form of rigidity, some form of rigidity. Either you're smoothly conjugate to the original or um, some of that structure is preserved some of the, the smooth structure that you had in the original system is preserved. Okay. So what happens with rigid rotations? So rigid what happens with what? Rigid rotations. Rigid rotations. Rigid rotation, the centralized is large. Right. But so what do I have to say about, no, 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 rigid rotations, correct. Um, so do I need to add, what do I need to add? Oh, I know what I need to add. Yeah, there's a really important thing. I, it, not just ergodic, but partially hyperbolic. Sorry. 
So you need to have some hyperbolicity because obviously, yes, it is false for rigid rotations. Yes. But there's many, many partially hyperbolic, most, um, most affine transformations of homogeneous spaces are partially hyperbolic. Okay, thank you. Oh, what's, yeah, her argument so uses no bounded distortion. distortion, right. So again, you can, by coup de smell or whatever, you can essentially reduce it to the situation where you're on an interval fixing two, well, in this case, an interval fixing two points. So you have a contraction, or you can do it from both sides. Um, and then, the, um, your, your diffeomorphism, um, I'll make sure I say this right. But I think that bounded distortion implies that your diffeomorphism embeds in a flow, um, a C2 flow that's C1 at the endpoints. So that's a, that's a con I mean, this is sort of a, a bit of an adaptation of Capel's argument. But um, so bounded distortion actually implies this. And then, so you know that anything that centralizes, C2 centralizes somehow has to embed in this flow. But then the question is, is that thing actually C1? Ah, um, oh, yeah, sorry. It embeds in a flow, but not on the entire interval. So there's a flow like this, that's C1 here. And there's a flow like this, that's C1 here. And what you want to show is that those two flows don't agree. <laughs> because if they were to, uh, don't agree everywhere. They only agree kind of on the orbit of F, essentially. And so that's, there, there's an invariant that comes from these two, from each of these flows, which is a diffeomorphism of a circle called the Mather invariant. And you just need to show that you can see two perturbed so that they're not the same, they're not conjugate flows. Yeah. Uh, you, you show that uh, your C1, sorry, your one-dimensional element or exploding mm -hmm. distortion, you manage to extend it in any dimension. Yeah. So would it be some universe and cost some set of diffeomorphism where this type of argument CR can be pushed in higher dimension? Well, but you have bounded distortion. Yeah, exactly. So then you use the Coppel argument. So you you have a one dimensional argument with closing distortion, you manage to push it in Oh, oh you're saying using Coppel's argument, yes. which you push it you onto push diffeomorphisms with um, possibly, possibly, yeah, I mean, if you had some structure, I mean, if you looked at the diffeomorphisms that have the structure of, for example, project, it would so be fiber by one dimensional matter. Right, right. Yeah, I mean, there, and there's an easy argument that shows if you're partially hyperbolic and accessible, then your centralizer is discrete. So that's already saying something. But sorry, this, we're getting too technical for the rest of the world. Uh, one more question. I think that's another question. It's just a silly question. Maybe, but, uh, looking at these properties that you talked about, right? The resistivity and you know, periodic, periodic orbits and so on. Do you expect this to sort of change with r if you're with r greater than or equal to 2? Oh, it totally changes. So, for example, you have um, you have KM phenomena like on the surface, and so if you have a single elliptic fixed point with the right data, then perturbing you maintain these invariant circles or ellipses, right? circles, and then so you're not about it. Depends on R. Yeah, so it depends on R. For C1 generic, um, Arturo Avila and Sylvana and I proved that. C1 generic with positive metric entropy with respect to volume, so again, volume preserving, implies urbanicity. So 
there's some hope that actually it might be generic in C1, but it's definitely not generic. I mean, you definitely have CR. Yeah, okay, it yeah it, it definitely things change. I mean, even the trivial centralizer on the circle or it changes from R equals 1 to R equals 2. You go from open yeah. dense to residual. Um, Any other? Okay, well, let's, oh, yes, uh, let's change R to K so we know it's an integer. Okay. Okay. Then, I remember math are always talking about k plus 1 as being the critical, d plus 1 for piece of dimension being the critical degree of smoothness. So I'm wondering if that nuance, because for surfaces you need a little better than C2 to have these mm -hmm. theorems, so you need, you know, it's like that in your integer, so mm -hmm. k plus 1. So I'm just wondering if that might be a nuance. So you mean like on a like five a manifold, you could go all the way up to C or CR and be able to. Oh, not C. It's not, C not CR. <laughs> sorry, C4. Sorry. Yeah. Okay. Right. You could go all the way up to C4 and maybe expect to see the generosity as well. Yeah, it's just it's just that. Because you have enough directions in which yeah. you can kind of violate. Right, and I think you have theorems oh. about the simplicity of the proof of different morphisms. That and K plus one was the critical smoothness mm -hmm. in, in the argument. So it yeah. relates to your question of group theory structure. Right. Okay. Yeah. I, I never understood exactly what the point was, but it was stated by uh, that. By Mather. Yeah. And then a few words. Yeah. It was. Yeah, I, um, I, know, I, I know that the group structure the dynamics of a group, like if you have like a nilpotent group of a certain degree, then the dynamics is related to the degree, I mean, dimension. the dimension of CD and the D. That kind of. Actually, it's not CD, it's like what you would like C1 plus 1 over D or something, where you get like a Donchelot counterexample or not. It's a little different. Okay, let's thank you.